Okay, let's start, inshallah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma alimna ma anfa'ana wa anfa'ana bima alamtana wa zidna ilman. Barakallahu fikum wa jazakum khair. Hope you are doing well, inshallah. Continuing, last time we spoke about the, the story of uh, the, you know, if, uh, if, I mean, of uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, and what happened with her, it was part of her, yeah, and her story, and this is, where we um uh, we stopped um where Abu Bakr radiallahu an he said that he would not support people who spoke ill of his daughter Khadija radiallahu anha and finally the Prophet وسلم, yani, there was a revelation that came don't you wish that Allah would forgive you? May Allah forgive everyone. I mean, and uh, yes, he then changed his mind and went back to supporting financially those people who spoke ill of his daughter, subhanAllah. I'm sure had it been any one of us, it would have been very difficult for us to go back and to allow or to support someone financially who had just back bit and slandered the chastity of our daughter right so Aisha for this Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam also asked Zainab bin Jash about my case and you know who Zainab is one of the whites of Prophet sallallahu he said oh Zainab what have you seen she replied oh Mr. Allah I protect my hearing and my sight. I know nothing but good about Aisha. Of all the wives of Allah's Messenger, وسلم, it was Zainab who aspired to receive from him the same favor as I used to receive. Yet Allah saved her from telling lies because of her piety. Meaning, Zainab was like the competition of Aisha. She was young, beautiful. And the Prophet used to Pay, like like her as well, like so he liked Aisha, the, you know, he loved her the most. Obviously, you cannot, you know, like take care of your heart. Your heart is your heart. So Zainab could have lied, could have said, you know, er, earn his favor because she was pious and she believed in Allah. She had taqwa. She didn't say anything. But uh, her sister, Hamna, kept on fighting on her behalf, so she was destroyed as those who invented and spread the slander okay so the sister of Zainab bin Jash was actually whipped yeah. the saying of Umbra Man to her daughter Aisha attracted my attention when the verses that explain her innocence were revealed and the house of Abu Bakr spear fight never to be touched with any harm again uh, Umbra Man um, Roman, go down. I told her daughter, get up and go to him. This expression carried any the love that she heard had for the Prophet. So, even though it was so hard, and imagine your daughter, and the Prophet was quite cold with her, as we know, as we saw it last time. That's just the way it is. It was not easy for him as well. Again, human beings. So, obviously she understood as a mother-in-law, but her yani, wisdom was rooted in, in Iman. Right? 
So <clears throat> she understood because of the deen. This is how it is. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us uh, in the Quran, we see the verse below. Right, wa min ayatihi an khalaqa lakum min anfusikum azwaja li taskunu ilayha wa ja'ala baynakum wa ja'ala baynakum mawaddatan wa rahma inna fi dhalika al-ayatin al-ayatin li qawmi yatafakkaru and amongst the signs that created for your wives from you amongst yourself that you may find response or repose in them sorry tranquility and in sukun and yes both between your affection love and mercy Rarely in this, these are signs for people react. Surah Rum, chapter 20, uh, 30, verse 21. And uh, obviously this day took like a big toll on, on her mother, and the mother Aisha. And obviously you can imagine, right, the, the emotional damage that uh, uh, it was only after a few months that she died. It was only after a few months that she actually she passed away. May Allah be pleased with her. Right? You know, like, you can die from the heart. You can die from stress. You can die from too many things. May Allah protect. But yeah, sometimes we have so much stress in our lives and families and this and that. Sometimes, you know, you don't want to take things too seriously when people talk about you. When people say stuff, it's better to just actually not take them too serious. I always think of Allah, what you can do for the deen, and don't, don't take things too seriously. It's not worth it to get too serious about stuff that people say, or people are going to be people, sadly, they like to talk, sadly, they like to say stuff, and, um, yeah, we need to, to take things sometimes lighter. It's going to hurt if not. So she died, radiallahu anha. And uh, as we said, the Prophet ﷺ buried her and praised her. May Allah give her Jannah. Now, let's go down. Remember what he said, right? Whoever wants to see a woman amongst the beautiful women of paradise who have wide and lovely eyes should look at Om Orman. May Allah be pleased with her. Now, so let's go back to Aisha radiallahu anha. So Aisha spent nine years in the Prophet's house. She was married to the Prophet sallam for nine years in his house. Um, yani, she was obviously um, the youngest and she was one of the most beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu Her marriage took place as an implementation of a divine revelation in Jajibiyya short of the Prophet in a dream actually. She was covered and the Prophet uncovered and Jibreel said, this is your wife. This is your wife. So it was and it's something that we know that the Prophet ﷺ was shown as a revelation. Let's go down. No. Tirmidhi, radiallahu reports that Aisha, that uh, she said that the angel Gabriel came with her picture in a green silk cloth and said, this is your wife in this world and hereafter. So she was the youngest, as we said. And obviously she would like love to play. And the Prophet seems to play with her. They had a very special relationship in terms of how they dealt with each other. And, uh, and the Prophet used to race with her and uh, go down. He used to uh, joke with her. And she was yeah, very, very young and even though obviously she when she reached her menses, she became a woman. Sometimes people don't understand that. You still have to treat a woman like sometimes just play with her joke like a child, you know, not to be too serious in everything. There's seriousness when 
she misbehaves or does something wrong. But in terms of just normal dealing with her, the Prophet ﷺ enjoyed fun with her affection. He used to call her O Aish and he used to allow her to you know, joke with him. And sometimes even she would get a bit out of line. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't like get so triggered, and, you know? Even when the Abyssinians came and they were dancing in the mosque and playing with arrows, she was watching. Rasul said was patient and allowed her. And um, subhanAllah, and she was one of his most and beloved to the point that um, Ammar ibn Yasr said that she was the sweetheart of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu an, he said that the first love in Islam was the love that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had for Aisha, radiallahu an. Yeah, I think it was Khadija, without a doubt. It was the first love. This is Anas ibn Malik's opinion, maybe, but... As we know, she was a child and young, so maybe forgot Khadija, but without a doubt, the first law was Khadija. And we know, we saw the previous hadith that even Aisha, when she said that Allah gave you something better than the old woman, the Prophet said that by Allah, he did not. He said by Allah, he did not. So obviously, we can deduce from this that the Prophet loved Khadija more. This is my opinion, Wallahu alam, but it's clear from the hadith. Now, yani Bukhari reports hadith that Aisha said that the people used to send presents to the Prophet وسلم, on the day of my turn. Okay? Meaning when it was her night and her day, whatever for him to be with her. So my companions, the other wives, the Prophet ﷺ, gathered in the house of Umm Salama. Okay? And we see again, for anyone who has ever experienced polygyny and understand how it is to have multiple wives, you will know that women naturally compete with each other, even if you have sisters in the house, let's say. Okay, let's say three, four, five sisters in one household. And subhanAllah, you know, it's it's amazing to see how they compete with each other sometimes, how they connect with each other, how they compete with each other, how sometimes they have camps, they argue, they fight. The way sisters fight and argue is very different than the way guys fight and brothers fight. Very, very different. Anyway, so they gathered in the house of Umm Salah. So now they made the like a little gang, you know. When they say, oh, Umm Salah, but Allah, the people chose to send presents on the day of Aish. Turn and we too love the good. And they love presents. Of course they do. As Aisha does. Right? So you should tell Allah's messenger to, to tell the people to send presents to him whenever he may be. Or whatever his turn may be. So Um Salam said to the Prophet and he turned away from her. And when the Prophet returned to her. Okay, so Um Salam, if you know, she was like, like the one that was like wise and the Prophet sometimes would take her counsel. So the, the women knew who to go to. They didn't go like Zainab or they didn't go to someone else. Like they would know who to kind of go to. You understand? Like they would know <laughs> which wife can have influence. They're smart. Strategic. Yeah. So they went to Salama and then we return. Let's go down. She Repeated the same to the Prophet. And he turned away. When she told him the same for the third time, the Prophet said, Oh, Salama, don't trouble me by harming Aisha. For by Allah, the divine inspiration never came to me while I was under the blanket of any woman amongst you except her. Okay. So, Yani, you can say, Why well, is this unfair? This and that. This is the truth, Yani. And he likes Aisha, radiallahu anha. And it seems that even as we know, for example, uh, Allah sent yani, salam only to Khadija. It seems that Allah sent a revelation amongst these wives now because there was a revelation that would come at the time of the 
خلاص اصلا when he was with Khadija but in this case he would send revelation يعني when he was when Aisha's house and not the other ones and so we see the hadith about the prophets and his sweat and his uh, revelation coming upon him they're narrated by Aisha radiallahu anh. so they didn't stop though they actually went to Fatima okay so the prophet's wife sent Fatima they're smart okay he didn't listen to him Sarah. now he loves Fatima that's his daughter that's his weakness that's his baby so they sent to Fatima prophet's daughter to him so she asked permission to enter while he was laying down with me in my woolen blank, meaning with Ash. So he permitted her to enter. And she said, Oh, Mr. Allah. And she's saying that in front of Aisha. Your wife sent me to you demanding for fairness. Look at that. Concerning your treatment of the daughter of Ibn Abi Quhafa, uh, meaning Yani Aisha. So I was there listening, but silent. She didn't like fight with her or, you know, sometimes they, you know, people would like fight back, right? So she said, I was listening, silent. And the message of Allah so said, oh, daughter, don't you love whatever I love? She said, yes. He then said, then you should love this lady, meaning he loves her, right? So here the author says something amazing. He says, Dear reader, this is a human side of the Prophet's person. Hearts, according to the Messenger of Allah, are between the two of the most merciful Lord's fingers. He twists them as he please. And the heart is named Qalb in Arabic because it's changing. It changes nature. Qalb, yani yan qalib. Yan qalib, in qalib means to flip. The supplication that the Messenger of Allah used to say frequently in prostration. Allahumma ya muqallib al qulub. Allah, the one who turns the hearts, keep my heart steady on your deen. Right? And the Prophet used to say, oh Allah, this is my division and that over which I have power. Do not blame me for over that which I have no power. You have power and I have no power. How you feel, how you this, how you that. So the great love was limitless. It transcended material things to do higher and more sublime, the soul, the heart, and the mind. The emotional irradiation of the love reflects a picture of the distinctness of the Prophet's household and the heart. So, Yani, this is it. Yani, it was the Prophet loved her. You cannot, you try your best to be the best, the most fair, but in the end, as Allah tells in the Quran, it's almost impossible to be fully fair because then you would have to be fair in love as well. And you cannot. Certain things that you cannot control. Okay. Al-Hakim said in his Mustadrak, one-fourth of the rules of the Sharia, one-fourth. Imagine that in the Hadith, are narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha. Abu Musa al-Ashari radiallahu anha said, whenever a Hadith was unclear to us, yeah, the companions, the Prophet they asked Aisha about her, about it. And we always gain knowledge about the hadith from her. And I want to mention something here. Uh, or maybe a bit later, I'm not sure if the author is going to mention, but I'll write it down and we'll mention it later. I want to see if you mention it. Uh, al mashruq says, I saw the elders among the companions of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asking her about the law of inheritance. But she was very knowledgeable because she heard so much from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was so young. She remembered. She narrated. She was smart. So she learned a lot. As Dukhri says, if Aisha's knowledge is compiled and compared to the knowledge of all women, her knowledge will surely excel theirs. He also said the first person to remove the stress from the people and explain to them the sunnah regarding that was Aisha, right? And we're not here explaining in detail the knowledge that the mother of the believers had and the high status, but some examples, Yani, as we see, that she knew and she had from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? So, go down.
uh, throughout the hadith reported, Prophet said, take the half of the knowledge of your religion from this Humaira, meaning Aisha, is weak. We nevertheless are not in doubt that the Messenger of Allah used to estimate Aisha's cleverness, uh, mental alertness, knowledge, and piety. May Allah be pleased with her. Now, here I don't understand the statement. Go back for a second. Take the half of your religion from this Sumaira is weak. Ah, okay, okay, okay. And the hadith is weak. Okay, the hadith is weak. Okay, I get it. The hadith is weak now. Now, uh, Aisha's house, while we discuss... Okay, I want to mention something here. Because maybe the author doesn't mention. But there was a big, big competition and debate and uh, difference of opinion. And you should know. Because you'll find hadith anywhere, the two butt heads. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she butted heads with who? First and foremost. I know you guys, I don't want you to think like I'm using the wrong words. And this is true though. Of course, we respect all the companions. I mean, the belief of Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah. But for the sake of knowledge, when we learn, we should learn and yani correct and know these things. I told you, like we need to learn and know these things, not that we will get surprised or by the enemies of Islam, like the Shia and stuff like that, right? Or the Kuffar, right? Who attack Aisha radiallahu anha, attack the Prophet and attack the companions. So, we know that Aisha butted heads with Ali radiallahu anh, in the Battle of Safin and Jamal. Many Sahabas died. We said that many Muslims died in those battles. Huge, huge loss. And Aisha was taken prisoner by Ali. A lot of people don't know Ali radiallahu anh, took her as a prisoner. We know, we can see. That during Qisatul Ifq, this uh, story when she was accused that Ali had a very strong stance. That maybe, I don't know, maybe she did what she did. He was thinking and that the Prophet said him should just not worry and then he can marry someone else. Okay, he was not like, no, it's okay, Ya Rasulullah, don't worry. She's right. She was, he wasn't like Jazaina, for example, right? So when it comes to politics, in the fitna, after the death of Uthman, radiallahu anh, which we studied in the book of Ibn al-Arabi, al-Awasim al qawasim Defensive Against Disaster. Um, so that was the fitna with Ali. But there was another, yani, fiqhi dif a difference, a fiqhi and aqidah difference, actually. <clears throat> Fiqhi and Aqidah difference. Okay? With who? With none other than Abu Huraira radiallahu anh, who was one of the most prolific narrator of hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is said when others used to go earn their risk and business and this and that, I used to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because people ask, how come he narrates so many hadith? Abu Huraira was one that narrated many hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. But he and Aisha deferred on certain fiqh things. And if I remember correctly, Aisha even used very hard words that, and he basically said Abu Huraira is kind of lying. And one of the main things that they deferred on was whether the Prophet ﷺ saw Allah on Al Isra al Miraj. Okay, whether the Prophet Sallam saw Allah, and it's a big difference. It's a huge difference of opinion. And this is an opinion in Aqidah. This is not fiqh here. This is Aqidah. Did the Prophet Sallam actually see Allah? So Abu Huraira 
radiyallahu anh, he believed that he did. The Prophet ﷺ and Aisha said that whoever says that he did, that he's lying. Okay, whoever says that the Prophet ﷺ saw Allah, how can he see him when he is, and there's a hijab of light. Abu Rehr, and he actually believed that the Prophet ﷺ saw Allah as he is. Like as we will see him on the Day of Judgment, he will remove the hijab. Sorry, in Jannah. Okay, so Aisha said that whoever says that, he is lying. And other any differences between her and Abu Huraira in fiqh and certain things of Aqidah. A lot of people might not know that, but we have to, as students of knowledge, understand these differences of opinion between these Sahaba and Sahabiyat of the Prophet. Okay? Now, so. Uh, let's move on. We see that the house, the Prophet, uh, the Aisha radiallahu anha, and it was like a room, and um, this is where the Prophet was that di he died and he was buried. Okay, this was the room, and it was the room that was connected to the masjid. Um, now, so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wished that he should be nursed while he was very sick, and this it is this room that the shelters. And remains two of the leaders, Abu Bakr and Omar, and because they were buried next to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If you remember, Omar radiallahu an, he asked the permission of Aisha to be buried next to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam before he died, and Aisha gave him permission. Right. So when you go to Medina, you have the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Abu Bakr, Omar. No, and some say that there is, yeah, I mean, some say. That there is, uh, there is a space there reserved for. Does anyone know for who? It's not necessarily an authentic any narration, but there is a saying. Does anyone know who the space is reserved for? Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman is not married there. Uh, buried there, so he's buried in Baqi. But there's it's re, uh, there's a space supposedly. It's not an uh, authentic necessarily. But it is something that it was said. So the Prophet, Abu Bakr, Omar. And then supposedly there's a space. And someone important will be buried next to the Prophet, uh, there next to uh, Omar. Anyone know who? Anyone ever heard the narration or the statement? Anyone can, want to take a guess? It's someone who was not, no, someone who was not, um, he's not a Sahabi. He is not a Sahabi. Who's still alive? <laughs> this needs to be buried, huh? <laughs> One, not a Sahabi, he's still alive, yes, and needs to be buried. And some there's been some narration that said that that spot is safe for him. Allahu alam. I'm not saying that it's like, yes, Aisa alayhi correct. No, not Jibreel. <laughs> Jibreel's not gonna be buried, he's an angel, he will die, but he will not be buried. Correct. It was Isa alayhi salam. Yes, there's some statements in Sanesha that said that that spot is safe for Isa when Isa alayhi salam will die. That he will be buried there. Oh, Allah. Now, all right. So, so uh, there's a story worth being told about uh, the bearing, yani the Prophet and the two leaders next to him. And um, her father had commanded her in his sick bed that he should be buried beside the Prophet. And obviously, she implemented this. A grave was dug for him. His head was made parallel with the shoulders of the Prophet. His grave was brought so close so that the Prophet and water was sprinkled on it. 
Okay. Go down. And then Omar, when he was stabbed, when he was stabbed by Abu Lu'lu and Majuzi, when Omar was stabbed by Abu Lu'lu and Majuzi, um, then um, he sought permission from Aisha. He didn't die right away. And he allowed, she allowed him. Okay. Um, so when um, Ibn Omar said that Omar's body was brought for burial at the door of Aisha's room, Ibn Omar said on the memorable moment, the slave of Allah, Omar ibn Khattab is seeking permission to enter into the house of the mother, the faithful Aisha. So Aisha allowed him and showed compassion. The mother of the faithful Aisha was increased in greatness and honor, for she used to say before Omar was buried there, it is only my husband and my father that are here. But after Omar was buried there, she said, I do not longer enter the room, but with my garments fastened because I was shy of the presence of Omar subhanAllah, even though he's dead yet. Compare that to <laughs> to um, <laughs> sorry, I but compare that to uh, uh, to some of the sisters today. Now, so she was shy of a, of a dead man. <clears throat> May Allah be pleased with her. So. The, the author said that he doesn't want to talk too much about the battle of the camel. Um, and he says, we are only going to say some calm and wise statements and not uh, convulsive and agitated statements that only divides and does not unite. We are saying a statement that is far above se sectionalism and bigotries. Um, which is true. Like, that's why it's very, it's a very, it's a very, um, sensitive issue however for us i think it's important that we understand these things yeah no um this we need to understand okay we as people are trying to seek knowledge we cannot just dismiss these things okay because they can cause a lot of problems and doubts if people don't know and understand Anyway, the narrations of the sources are unanimous. The negotiations that took place between Ali on one side and Talha, who's Talha? Go down. Talha uh, is the Sahab. And then Az Zubair and Aisha on the other side. Okay, so imagine on one side is Ali. Okay, Ali on one side and Talha as Zubair ibn Awam. And you understand who's that Zubair and Abdullah ibn Zubair and Aisha were on one side. They were on her side. He said others were almost successful in arriving at a truce and peace. But, um, yeah, there was some of the Munafiqeen. And all that that uh, got involved, and you know things didn't work out, right? So the situation exploded, and the Sabia started the war, and the rest is now history. They they tried to reach a a compromise, and um, sorry, the Sabia Abdullah bin Saba. He was one of the, uh, the Munafiqin, the Jews who had certain things. They say he was one of the Jews. Anyway, the Munafiqin, the, the troublemakers, started the war, and that spilled into it. And the reality is that the Sahaba, they, 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 they had a war. It was a big crisis, as I said. Now, let's go down. I know that most traditional 
people are not going to like to discuss this because it is sensitive and to be honest, I mean, it is a fitna, but um, no, it's, it's, uh, it happened. It happened. So, in the month of Ramadan, in the year 58, the Hijri, Aisha had her fatal illness and she said in her will, do not follow uh, my beer with the fire nor lay a red velvet piece. She then surrendered her soul on the night of Tuesday, the 17th of Ramadan, at the age of 66. She died at the age of 66. Okay. And she was buried in Al Baqi at the Salatul Witr. Jannatul Baqi. Okay. So 66, Sammy, and she died 58th of Hijr, right? So she lived many years after the Prophet Sallallahu So she died, yani, older than the Prophet Sallallahu When the Prophet Sallallahu died, he was what? He was 60, 62, right? Aisha died at 66. Okay, 66. Right? But she was? Yani, child lived him by and many, many years. Yeah, I'm like 40 something years or more. Now, let's go down. All right, so that's uh, Aisha, radiallahu anha. Very, very important to know everything about her, the fitna around her. As I said, the battles, the civil battles, but also what the Shia say. This is important to understand. And one of, if you ever have a discussion with the Shia, and in Malaysia it's not so much. It's not a big deal when it comes to the Shia. But, um, yeah, it, uh, I heard that there is a, there was a, um, there was an attempt. There was an attempt at some point of the Shia to, um, to uh to enter Malaysia and to do something, but the government stopped it quite uh quite quick, and they're trying to to attack Sabah, Sarau, those areas where people are uh, maybe there's not so much down in that side a lot, but um, but the Shia they believe that Aisha was like a murtad and the kafir. And that when the Mahdi is going to come, he's going to punish her and crucify her. And he's going to crucify Abu Bakr and Omar. And Uthman. No, not Uthman. Yeah, and Uthman. And he's going to crucify them. That they're kuffar, they're murtads, they're apostates. That they were against the family of the Prophet ﷺ. That they took the leadership from the family of the Prophet ﷺ. And Aisha, yani, radiallahu anha, the Shia, they let's say if they want to call a woman a like bad woman, like a prostitute, they will use this like the name of and they will say she is a this and, and use the name. Okay, so if uh, usually if a Shia wants to insult a woman, let's see, even amongst themselves, if women want to use the, the B word, they're not going to use the B word, they're going to use the name, they're going to say Aisha. Okay, that's how bad their hatred is for Aisha radiallahu anha. And I said they believe that that uh, Al-Mahdi is going to uh, punish her, resurrect her. Imagine that resurrect them out of their grave and then he will uh, crucify them. These are some some narrations yani, that are mentioned there. There's a lot of hatred among the Shia or Aisha. And some of the ones of the Prophet ﷺ. And they don't consider them as his family. Okay. They do not consider them as Ahl Bayt. Okay. For them, Ahl Bayt is only Hassan, Hussein, Ali, Khadija, Fatima, the daughters of the Prophet. ﷺ. Anyone, Abdul Abbas, anyone who's related, Abdullah bin Abbas, anyone who's related. 
to the Prophet and those at Ahlul Bayt, and everyone else is not. Um, do you know how do you refute the accusation that they're not from the house of the Prophet? Ahlul Bayt yani, means the people of your home. Obviously, the wives of the Prophet were in his home, yeah, right? So that's the first thing. So how do you refute if someone says that, you know, no, they're not from the family. They're not Ahl al-Bayt. There's a clear refutation. By the way, the, the Shia, they don't know the Quran too well. Okay? If you ever search any I mean, Shia reciting Quran, they don't have Quran. They listen to our parties. If you want to listen to Quran in general, they will listen to our qadis. They don't have reciters of the Quran from the Shia, very few. They don't have memorizers of the Quran, very few. They have some, but not like we do. Even when they pray, like in the masjid and stuff like that, they they don't recite properly. Their ayatollahs, especially the Iranian ones, they, they don't have, like they don't know Arabic properly. They're not like proper ulama. They don't memorize the books, hadith, and stuff like that. Even their stuff. The main book of that they refer to is called Usul al-Kafi. Usul al-Kafi. Okay? Keep in mind that this name. So, but they don't have. I mean, it's funny. They, they'll pray sometimes. You find it. They put the Quran on their head. Okay? So they hate hadith, uh, Aisha. And they believe the Quran, a lot of them, a lot of them, not all, again, do not generalize because amongst them, there are different schools of thoughts, different madahib, like the Ja'fariya, for example. Ja'fari, who is, uh, yani, Ja'far al-Sadiq, was a great imam, yani, even of Ahl Sunnah. But the Shias claim him, but he was a great imam of Ahl Sunnah. And uh, he was related to Prophet and uh, yeah, the the Jafaris in general, they are close to close to the Sunnah in their fiqh. Fiqh Jafariya, it's a madhab, and at some point was a popular madhab, and it was accepted in certain places. Still alive in certain places. Uh, some of the Alqafs in the Arab countries, for example, in the UAE, the Ja'far Madhab is like accepted. Like for the Shias who want to practice Islam in the UAE, uh, obviously it has to be regulated by the government. So the Ja'far Madhab is what they can follow. And some of the mosques in the UAE have to be obviously under the Alqaf, all of them actually. Therefore, they have their own Imams, their own ulama, but they are of the Ja'fari sect, like they cannot be, for example, Houthis. As you know, the Houthis are the ones in Yemen. Okay, now even the ones in Yemen at some point, their madhab was not like the Shia of Iran or the Shia of uh, Lebanon or Iraq. Okay, they were just not like that. But things have been changing recently in the past 10 years due to politics and political things, right? Hezbollah, same. There are like 12 Imam Shias. They're not really like the proper Ja'fari Madhab and so on. Some of the, yeah, some of the Yemeni uh, Shias are not like people who hate Abu Bakr and Omar and so on. Okay. Uh, good question. The shares are conference concerned kufa. Um, so it depends. It depends. In general, not their ulama. In general, their ulama could be kufa if they, because they have the knowledge, and if they hold beliefs that Abu Bakr and Omar are kufa, then yes, they are kufa. Okay, if they hold that Aisha is a bad woman, like they actually believe she committed zina. Uh, so if they believe the statements, then yes, then they are kuffar. If they don't believe the statements and they don't believe that Abu Bakr Omar, Uthman, and kuffar, Aisha is a kafira, and that they should like the sunnah, they should, you know, and throughout, there's a big history on this, of what happened. 
but then they are not kuffar. But their ulama, because they have the knowledge, uh, some of the, like Ibn Taymiyyah and others have, yani, kafara ulama They made kuffar of their ulama. Again, regular people, they might not know, they might not, they just pray, they just fast, and they don't know. They might not even believe in those things. They don't even know, like, who's Abu Bakr or Omar sometimes. They just hear stuff. So in, in general, the regular people are like, I and mean, they they say shahada, they face the qibla, they pray, all that, even though they combine Dohar and Asr, Mughal and Isha, okay, for weird reasons, but not all of them. Again, don't generalize, right? But if they hold their beliefs that, as I said about Bakr and Omar, then yes, they are. And if they, and if they, um, um, and if they, um, and if they, um, and if they um, yeah, if they hold those beliefs and then, yeah, then they're ulama and so on, and they curse the Sahaba, then yes, then they make kufa, okay? If they curse the Sahaba, and they make, if they go to the graves and they do their weird things, then that's kufr. And a lot of it happens in Iran and like Karbala, for example, in, in Iraq, uh, where they have their pilgrimages. They don't even go to Mecca. They do these pilgrimages, and they do some weird stuff. They do some shirk. And yes, that kicks them out of Islam, even if they don't realize it. That invalidates their iman, nawaqid al-iman, as we know. Uh, with regards to whether their meat is permissible, yani, if they slaughter in the name of, like they say, Ya Ali, okay, and a lot of them say this, Ya Hussein, Ya Ali, they don't say Bismillah. When they do something, they say Ya Hussein, Ya Ali, Ya Hassan, but mostly not Hassan. They don't like Hassan that much, even though they say they do, but mostly be like Ya Hussein, and it'll still be Ya Ali. Okay, if they do that, then this is not permissible. Hard to know. But it is not fair. If it's slaughtered according to the Quran and Sunnah, and they follow the proper procedures, and they don't hold those beliefs of kufr, then yeah, it's different. But I, I would tell you to, it's better to stay away from eating from them because you don't know what they do and what they say. I'm telling you, like instead of saying Bismillah, Ya Allah, they say, instead of saying Ya Allah, for example, they say Ya Ali, <laughs> Ya, ya Hussein. <laughs> they don't even say Ya Muhammad in general. They usually just say Ali Ya Hussein. <laughs> they are interesting, interesting, uh, you know, thing. So, uh, now, now, um, so let's uh, understand this, okay? It's a very important point, guys. Very important point for us to understand as Muslims, and how to deal, because you never know when you have to doubt. You never know when, even if someone like a, a non-Muslim asks, like, why do you guys have Sunni and Shia? And he's an intellectual, sure he wants to know. Obviously, he sees what's happening in the world. And they might have questions. Why are you guys so split? Why are you guys so different? Why are you guys so this or that? And they go into, like, a deeper conversation. Okay, I'm very convinced about Islam, but this thing is stopping from embracing Islam. You can explain to them. You can explain to them. Even the Shia, even the beginning to the history. Yeah, the problem with the Shia is not just their history and what they believe. The problem with the Shia is that their aqid is wrong. They believe weird things about Allah. They believe weird things about their imams. That their imams, some people believe their imams, the 12 imams, are better than the prophets. They're not all, but some. They believe that being an imam comes first before being a Prophet. Okay. And when you say, for example, Ajan al Muttaqeen al Imam, right? It's like you're making a dua to be an Imam and this and that. And they come up with all kinds of different proofs and evidences. And they have their books and their dawah. And they try to quote you hadith from your own scriptures, i.e., the corpus of hadith that we have. And they have madrasas and schools where they learn how to do how to do um missionary work in the world it's not so big anymore like to be honest in the early 2000s 
when I converted to Islam, I was so I would see it a lot more. There was a lot more missionary work. And I got involved in some debates with them. And I think I told you guys about my like one of my best friends who became Shia. The guy that I did Umrah with, and you know, we were debating all the time <laughs> on the airplane around the cab everywhere. So yeah, it's like um but their missionary work is not that strong anymore. It used to be. In the, I don't know if you guys are aware, but the early 2000s, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, that time there was a lot of debates online, like Christian, Muslim, Muslim, Shia, Ahmadiyya were on the, like everyone's doing Dawah. YouTube just came out. Everyone was dawa. There was um, the chats on, I um, can't remember what it was called. Uh, but anyway, there was these like online chats where people would go in. IRC, yeah, IRC was one. That was one. But there was other ones as well. I cannot remember. Uh, I forgot, but anyway, people would meet on these rooms, right? And then they would just have these like debates, and it's just a lot on YouTube, like it was in you know, and in churches and mosques, there's a lot of debates that are taking place. A lot of people are doing dawa, a lot of dawa videos, this that. Now they don't do as many. Like I don't, I think people are just making their own videos now. But it used to be a, like an interesting time in the period of. You know, debates and, uh, you know, Dr. Zakanaik obviously was out at that time. Uh, before him, actually, I remember when Ahmadina, uh, he passed away. It was the summer when I converted, well, I converted to Islam the year before that, but that summer it was probably my first summer as a Muslim. And I remember I was working in Toronto in construction. And uh, I remember we went to the Juma, and then they announced that he passed away. Rahimallah. So Ahmed Didat and then Zakar Naik, obviously was a student. And um, yeah, there was all these debates. Uh, at that time, Shabir Ali was around as well. Still around, but kind of changed now. Uh, yeah, it was just full of very eventful things the Shias were debating. There was an interest, there was an imam mm. that came to our university, I can't remember, but he was Malaysian. <laughs> I remember him very well. He was from the U.S., from Detroit, from Michigan. I don't know if you guys know him or if you guys know, but he was, yeah, like a, a Malaysian imam, and he was a very like liberal imam. That was the first like liberal imam that I was like introduced to. I was like, I came to be aware of like these people. And I remember we're like first year of being Muslim, we're in this debate at the university. And he was just having an interfaith dialogue with this like Catholic shirki like priest, you know, they're trying to do like an interfaith dialogue. And the Malaysian guy was so like nice and uh, you know, yeah, everyone's good. And I remember this lady asked him, like, well, I pray to statues and I do Hail Mary. Does that mean I go to hell? And he's like, no, you're safe because God says that you are Ahl Kitab. And I was like, what? And I was like, I had, a, I had beef with him. I went and talked to him after. I was like, whoa. I was like, why do you say that? And I gave him the verse of God because I was like comparing, doing comparative studies because I was just a new Muslim. I was getting attacked by everyone, you know, why did you convert to Islam? All my ex-Catholic uh, high school students who were with me, uh, you know, found out that I became Muslim. And yeah, so everyone was like debating. So I was doing like an in-depth study. And, you know, I went and talked to him. I was like, bro, I said, yani, قُلْ يَا يُلْكَافِرُونَ يعني, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ يعني, How many verses about the Islam and the statues and Ibrahim broke the statues and you're telling this woman she this might be her only chance that someone will tell her that you're wrong and you're telling oh don't worry you're okay you're safe you're from the people of the book and she asked in front of everyone and you know what he said to me he's like oh you know we're living in a difficult difficult time after 9-11 we just have to get along I was like bro and that's why I think that 
And I remember it pushed me to like do more DAO because I was like, bro, this is the only chance. This woman might come to you on the day of judgment and she's going to say, Imam so and so. And he's like an Imam, like he was an Imam in the masjid. Imam so and so uh, told me that it's okay if I worship statue. And I say, Hail Marys and all that. So just funny because I remember he was Malaysian. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, inshallah. All right, Barakallahu Fikum. May Allah bless all of you. Uh, Allah will see you uh, next week. No, because I am traveling. Inshallah. Um, the week after. Okay, Barakallahu Fikum. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika. Shadu wa la ila ila. Tastawfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah. Yeah.